The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton, for the stay. Exchanging gifts. All right. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about diplomacy on the early American frontier, uh, particularly between Native American peoples and European peoples. We're going to talk about some of the uh, customs and protocols that governed that style of diplomacy and the objectives that both Native American peoples and uh, colonial peoples brought to those meetings. Uh, I've got an image here uh, that's actually a painting from 1903 that is depicting one such uh, treaty conference that went on on the frontier of New York in the Mohawk Valley. You did a reading today that featured a fellow named William Johnson that not a lot of you know, contemporary American students of history know much about, but he was a very interesting figure in the 18th century. He was an Irish immigrant who came to America, settled on the Mohawk frontier of upstate New York in the 1740s, and became very uh, friendly with the Mohawk Indians who were his neighbors, and ultimately gained a great deal of influence among them, and ultimately was appointed by the British Crown to serve as its agent to the Iroquois nations. And so this uh, painter in the early 20th century wanted to depict one of these treaties that Johnson convened uh, with Native Americans. Uh, think about the reading you did for today, and this is kind of providing you with a mental image of that. Uh, it was at Johnson Hall, which was this Georgian mansion he built on the Mohawk frontier that still stands today. And if you are in upstate New York, traveling between, say, Albany and Syracuse, New York, you can get off the New York State Thruway and you can visit this site and you can visit another one of his homes that predated this, both of which are preserved as state historic sites in New York, and tell a really interesting story about how Europeans and Native Americans came together on the frontier not to fight, but actually just to talk about their uh, differences and to try to come to some kind of accommodation when they did have conflicts. Uh, I want to um, switch from upstate New York to Pennsylvania right now. And if you were to travel uh, east of Gettysburg for maybe an hour and a half or so along Route 30, you would come to the town of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I imagine some of you have been to Lancaster uh, and are familiar with it. And in 1744, Lancaster was just this tiny little frontier community that was um, really on the edge of, of settlement in Pennsylvania. But in June of 1744, a group of 250 Iroquois Indians arrived in Lancaster. Uh, they were carrying arms, bows and arrows and guns and tomahawks. They marched through the center of town, and you might imagine that this would cause some kind of panic among uh, the folks who lived in this tiny frontier town. This was the Quaker colony of Pennsylvania. There wasn't even a militia to call out uh, in fear of uh, perhaps an attack from, uh, from, from the Iroquois. But they weren't there to make war. They were there for a treaty conference that had been called by the governor of Pennsylvania. So they marched through town, their leader singing a song of greeting to uh, the people of Lancaster, and when they got to the edge of town, it didn't take long to walk down Main Street, they encamped. They, they, they built a camp of wigwams and cabins and stayed in Lancaster for about the next two and a half weeks, negotiating not only with the colony of Pennsylvania, but also with delegations from the colonies of Maryland and Virginia as well. This became known as the Treaty of Lancaster of 1744, and it was one of the more famous of these meetings that took place on the frontier between colonial governments and Native American peoples. Benjamin Franklin, at the time that the Lancaster Treaty was occurring, was working as a printer in Philadelphia. And he was anxious to hear news of, of, of what was going on in Lancaster. And he wrote to his agent in London, a fellow who sent him books to sell in his print shop, and he sent things to his agent in London to sell. And he wrote to him, and included this description of what was going on in Lancaster. A treaty is now holding in Lancaster County, a place 60 miles west of this city, 
between the governments of Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania on one side, and the United Five Nations of Indians on the other, meaning the Iroquois uh, League. I will send you an account of it when printed, as the method of doing business with those barbarians may perhaps afford you some amusement. Now that's a pretty condescending statement for Franklin to be making about this, right? Uh, certainly it reflects uh, many of the attitudes of his contemporaries that these were savage people out living in the forest and um, when he calls them barbarians, he's kind of sneering about it to his, to his London agent. But there's also an element here of fascination and interest, right? This method of doing business. Franklin wants to tell his London agent about how you do this business on the American frontier of engaging uh, in diplomacy with Native Americans. <coughs> and in that phrase, this method of doing business, I think is a very important um, fact to realize you know, for, for our purposes today. And that's that when Europeans came to colonial America and met with Native Americans, uh, it happened on Native American terms. You know, in order to ensure a good trade, in order to ensure peace, they had to get together and conduct diplomacy with Native American peoples. And the protocols and customs and language and metaphors that governed that diplomacy were not European in origin. They were Native American in origin. This is a testimony to the amount of power that Native American people had, that Europeans had to learn to conduct business on their, tour, on their turf, right? To do it uh, by their method. And so Franklin, when he uh, ultimately publishes the Treaty of Lancaster, does send something like 200 copies off to his agent in London because he thinks they might sell there. He thinks people in London might be interested in, in learning about this and in, in learning about Native American people through this context of diplomacy. Um, <coughs> Historians, uh, when they talk about diplomacy uh, between Native Americans and Europeans in the colonial era, often use a metaphor that I like that I'll share with you today, which is the middle ground. Uh, that these diplomatic negotiations reflected a middle ground between European power and interests in early America and Native American power and interests. And uh, the fellow who, who pioneered the use of this metaphor is a historian named Richard, Wright, uh, Richard White. Some of you uh, may have heard of him before. But he was writing about the French interactions with uh, Algonquian peoples living in the Great Lakes frontier as the French were developing their fur trade in places like uh, modern day Illinois and Michigan. That, that this, there was this middle ground where neither the French nor the Native Americans had the upper hand in terms of military power or strength. Each side wanted something from the other, the fur trade, right? Uh, each side had to learn to negotiate somehow with the others. You know, and these people were, were culturally different. They were strangers. There were language divides. And so uh, White, when he wrote about the middle ground, described it not only as this uh, geographic territory of the modern day Midwest, where French and Native peoples were coming together, but also this metaphorical middle ground where each side is trying to feel out the other, kind of trying to comprehend its worldview and develop some means of communicating uh, back and across that cultural divide. And that we're going to use that metaphor today, only we're going to apply it primarily to the English colonies in, in, in British North America as they dealt with Native American peoples and also sought this kind of diplomatic uh, middle ground to negotiate with them. So let's look at um, this middle ground, especially as it developed in the context of ritual, all right? how diplomatic rituals emerged that helped Europeans and Indians comprehend each other. There were two primary ritual complexes that Europeans learned to use when they engaged with Native Americans. One was Algonquian in origin. Think of the Algonquian language group that we talked about and the many Native peoples who were uh, connected to that language group, especially in the Great Lakes region. And the other was Iroquoian, related to uh, peoples of upstate New York, modern day Ontario, who spoke languages uh, from the Iroquoian stock. The uh, first of these that we'll talk about is the Calumet ceremony, which was associated with Algonquian Native American peoples from the Great Lakes region. And the Calumet was a pipe that Native Americans used. We know Native Americans grew tobacco before Europeans showed up. They smoked tobacco for all sorts of reasons. 
One of the reasons they smoked tobacco was for ritualistic purposes. It was a way of greeting strangers. It was a way of offering hospitality. It was a way of initiating and closing diplomatic negotiations with each other. But when you did it for that purpose, when you smoked tobacco for diplomatic reasons, you smoked it out of this long-stemmed pipe that was called a calumet pipe. This is not a pipe you know, that a Native American would be carrying around you know, just for his daily smoking. This was a pipe that was made specifically for diplomatic purposes. It has eagle feathers uh, attached to it. Um, it has a stone bowl that is made out of a type of soft red stone called catlinite that was found in Minnesota and that Indians could carve into the shape for pipe bowls. And here we, we've seen this image before when I was talking about the fur trade and you see a trade hatchet there. But here this Indian is smoking a calumet pipe. They're distinguished by those very long stems. And when native uh, peoples of Algonquian descent got together uh, to engage in diplomacy, the calumet pipe would be circulated in a circular fashion among the participants in a treaty council to kind of clear the air. It's funny because we think of tobacco smoke as something that you know, is very unpleasant and you don't want to be stuck somewhere where people are smoking. But their notion was that tobacco cleared the air of, of, of bad thoughts. Right? The, the, the tobacco smoke carried away ill feelings, worries, concerns, and kind of cleared the minds of people who were coming together to engage in negotiations. This is a, uh, a French illustration of what the Calumet ceremony looked like. And it's a really interesting image that you could um, read like you might read a modern day uh, cartoon strip, comic strip, only you need to read it in this order. I've added the numbers here so you can understand the action that is taking place here. All right? uh, number one, the Savage Village. All right? This is where uh, a, 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 there's a Native American community and then there's another group of Native Americans who are traveling by canoe downriver, and they want to pass through the territory of these folks. But they need to do so in a way that makes clear that they are, on, you know, that they are arriving as friends, that they are not here to make war, right? they're not here as aggressors. And so a canoe goes ahead of the others with the calumet of peace, and you see these three Indians in a canoe, and this object here is the calumet. They are carrying the calumet before them. And a canoe comes out from the village to greet them. So they see what's going on. They see the calumet pipe, so they come out to offer a greeting. And then the calumet is carried before the new arrivals, the visitors, as a sign of peace. And folks come out from the village to greet them. There's ritualistic dancing. And then they are admitted into the village and um, ultimately, they smoked the calumet as a way of proving their friendly intentions, and the locals provide hospitality, and they can, can go on with their business. So that's how the calumet ceremony worked. Um, and we do this. Uh, this has entered the American idiom of English through the phrase smoking the peace pipe. You know, we've all heard about smoking the peace pipe as a way of making amends, a way of making peace when there's been a disagreement or something. That's the origin of that phrase in English, is uh, the Calumet ceremony. All right. The other primary ritual complex that was used in Native American and European diplomacy was Iroquoian in origin. And it was related to those Native Americans who showed up at the Treaty of Lancaster in 1744. The, uh, the Iroquois League, or the Five Nations, as Franklin called, him, called them in that letter that he wrote to his agent in London. This is a map. Uh, if you haven't encountered the Iroquois before, this is just a map to kind of give you a, a very brief introduction into the Iroquois League or Confederacy. Uh, at the time of colonization, when the Dutch showed up, there were five nations in the Iroquois League. From east to west, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas and the Senecas. They occupied a territory roughly commensurate with modern day upstate New York from the city of Albany in the east to the city of Buffalo in the west. In the early 18th century, a sixth nation migrated northward from North Carolina and joined the Iroquois League. They were the Tuscaroras. So sometimes you'll hear references to the five nations, sometimes you'll hear references to the six nations. The Tuscaroras were also Iroquoian speaking. 
So even though they came from North Carolina, they spoke a similar language, had a similar culture, and that's one of the reasons why they came up and settled uh, in, in this region. The Tuscarora settled between northeastern uh, Pennsylvania and um, in central New York. They were a very powerful Indian confederacy. We learned about the Powhatans and the Chesapeake. Well, the Iroquois had similar power in this very strategic territory between uh, French Canada, St. Lawrence River, Ontario, and Dutch New, New Netherland, and ultimately English New York. So they occupied this very strategic territory, and uh, diplomacy with the Iroquois became very important to the French, to the Dutch, and to the English in order to preserve their fur trade. And when Europeans engaged in this diplomacy with the Iroquois, they had to learn something known as the condolence ceremony. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how the condolence ceremony worked. All right. So when the Iroquois League got together, usually on an annual basis, to renew friendship and alliance between the member nations, they began their negotiations with each other by engaging in a condolence ceremony, whereby each nation offered its condolences to the other nations for losses they had suffered since the last time they met. You know, somebody uh, important had died, or perhaps there had been warfare with outsiders and you know, casualties had been suffered and so forth. And so the message, the opening message, was condolence to assuage the grief of those people who were bereaved, who, had, who were suffering losses since the last time they met. And this was expressed by exchanging wampum beads in wampum belts. Right. Wampum were beads made out of marine shell, marine shells that could be found along the coast of Long Island in New England. They were very important to the Iroquois because they held a great deal of spiritual power. And so wampum, the exchange of wampum, became the symbol of condolence. And you began diplomatic negotiations by exchanging usually beads uh, on strings of wampum that represented uh, in, in this very, very metaphorical language, uh, they talked about giving uh, three strings of wampum to dry the te tears, open the ears, and clear the throats of those who were grieving so that they could now see, hear, and speak clearly again. Right? So this was a symbolic way of recognizing the, the um, kind of the burdens that people brought with them to these diplomatic uh, negotiations, and then the wampum was meant to clear away all those bad thoughts, kind of doing the service that the tobacco was doing in the Calumet ceremony, right? So that you could now see, speak, uh, hear clearly, and engage uh, openly in these diplomatic negotiations. Um, when wampum beads were strung together on strands of leather, you could make a wampum belt. And this is what a wampum belt may have looked like. Now, this is acrylic wampum uh, that I, I, I bought from some folks who, who use basically modern methods to recreate this for you know, people who are involved in the reenacting community and things like that. But it's a pretty good approximation of what the size of these wampum beads look like, and especially their color. They were made uh, out of uh, two colors, white and purple, that represented the marine shells that they came from. And those contrasting colors could then be woven into designs and belts. And we'll see some of these uh, a, a little later. But a lot of these designs, like you see here, like you see here, have these geometric patterns that emphasize linking. Right? So a linking of arms or, or, or diamonds that uh, are, are linked at the corners. And that's meant to show kind of unity and strength. Purple or black wampum, they sometimes called it black wampum, often was used to symbolize war or mourning. White wampum was used to symbolize peace, well-being. Uh, and so there's a color symbolism that's associated with these, uh, with, with these wampum beads as well. And so they became devices, material devices, that were used to uh, engage in the condolence ceremony. You can pass that around. And if you were a European diplomat who was going out to meet Native Americans, to engage in this diplomacy, you better bring your wampum. All right? If you don't have wampum, your message is meaningless. And so this is an example of how these Native American customs and rituals were something that Europeans had to learn 
to, to use and, uh, and manipulate if they were going to treat with the Indians and uh, get their objectives. Another type of gift that was exchanged in the, context, in the context of the condolence ceremony were black strouds. We talked about strouds in the fur trade, and black strouds were really uh, navy blue strouds that were produced in England and that were a big part of the textiles exchanged in the fur trade. But when given in the context of a condolence ritual, they became black strouds that were meant to cover the graves of the deceased to allow grieving uh, relatives to, to kind of put away the grief of those who had died and, again, uh, clear the ears, eyes, and throat so that they could engage in negotiations. So do we have any questions about the condolence ceremony or the uh, Calumet ceremony? Yes. So how did the British learn how to make the wampum? So like, did they trade with other Indian, Indian nations for the wampum? That way they could give it to other ones, or did they learn how to make it themselves? Yes, how did, how did wampum get manufactured? That is a, uh, it's a great question. So Native Americans manufactured wampum before Europeans showed up. But when Europeans show up, they also bring tools that make it much easier to manufacture wampum. And so wampum beads tend to get much smaller because they're using iron tools to grind and then drill holes in the beads. And Native Americans continue to make wampum, uh, but Europeans also become very interested in purchasing it. And so wampum becomes kind of commodified. You know, in early New Netherland, it's supposedly used as money you know, uh, uh, before, you know, when, when the economy is, is just developing there. Uh, and by the 18th century, we see evidence of wampum kind of being mass produced for the purpose of engaging in, in this type of diplomacy. Uh, the belts themselves were generally uh, made by Native American women. Uh, at the Treaty of Lancaster in 1744, 250 Indians arrive. Approximately half of them are adult males. The other half are women and children. And when these treaty negotiations are going on, many of the women are spending time creating the wampum belts that will be exchanged in the course of the proceedings. So it is a, it is a Native American art that um, contact with the Europeans is changing the production process and the value, but it's still very much a, a Native American process by which it's being produced. All right, well, let's... Um, Move on, and we'll talk a little bit about these, these treaty conferences that so fascinated Franklin. Uh, and in our view, our modern view, if I say to you treaty, you probably think of a document. You know, you think about the Treaty of Versailles that ended uh, World War I, or you think about the Peace of Paris of 1783, which ended the American Revolution. You know, we tend to think of treaties as texts that are the result of negotiations, and Europeans who treated with Native Americans when they got together for these diplomatic meetings generally had very specific objectives, right? We're getting together with Native peoples to talk about specific issues that have come up that need to be resolved. So, you know, matters of war and peace. We need to convince some Native uh, allies to go to war with us, or we need to convince some enemies to make peace with us, or they might uh, have issues about the fur trade, right? Uh, we need to initiate contact with these people so that we can expand our fur trade into that region. Uh, by the, by the um, mid-18th century, the era of the French and Indian War, a big part of these treaty negotiations involves the repatriation of captives, Europeans trying to get Native Americans who they've been warring with to return captives who have been taken. So these are kind of the very finite objectives that Europeans often brought to the negotiating process. And then, ideally, a treaty would produce a written document at the end that kind of put all this down in writing so Europeans could archive it and refer to it the next time they had an issue with the natives. Uh, the Native American perspective was a little different. For the Native Americans, the treaty was about process as much as it was about objectives. You know, it mattered equally as much, maybe even more so, that you observe the proper rituals and customs in engaging in these treaties than any specific objective that was reached, you know, uh, agreement that was written down at the end. Uh, the Iroquois, when they wrote about, uh, or when they talked about treaty making, used uh, a couple of, of very interesting metaphors. Uh, one was polishing the chain. They talked about their alliance with English uh, colonies as the covenant chain alliance. You know, a chain has many links 
Together they have strength. And so uh, they talked about the need to periodically brighten the chain or polish the chain so that it would not rust and break. In other words, you periodically have to get together with us and reenact all these rituals so that we know you, you remain a person of goodwill, a person who's, who's willing to treat us as equals. Uh, they also use another metaphor of clearing the path, that um, the exchange and contact between native and colonial communities occurred along a path, and that path would become overgrown. It would have brambles, it would have you know, trees that fell on, it would have all sorts of obstacles, and therefore, periodically, you needed to get together and clear the path so that trade and communication remained open between both sides. And so uh, this tension developed in the colonial era between native peoples who saw treaty making is, is a regular part of, of, of just having these relations with outsiders. You know, you got together periodically, you engaged in these rituals as a sign of your goodwill and good intentions. And Europeans who kind of didn't have a lot of patience for this, you know, they tended to want to treat uh, only when there was a specific issue. Uh, they didn't like the amount of time that these treaty negotiations took or the expense that was often involved with them. And so a kind of tug of war develops between uh, colonial governments, which are trying to minimize the time and the expense of these treaty conferences, and Native American peoples who are saying, hey, look, you need to show us proper respect. You need to show us that you uh, care about us as allies and as trading partners and so forth. And so um, those treaty negotiations uh, take place throughout the 17th and 18th century, and they become increasingly frequent over the course of the colonial era as colonists kind of get worn down by the Indians' demands that colonists treat them according to these terms. And frankly, as colonial governments too get a little more savvy about how to engage in this business and, and, and go about doing it. So what did a, a treaty conference look like? In Lancaster, in 1744, the Indians are in town for about two and a half weeks. So 250 Indians in town with you know, a town that probably has about 200 inhabitants. Uh, you've got delegations from three colonial governments there. What's, what's going on? What, what, what makes it uh, a treaty conference? The, the primary activity is making speeches, is each side giving speeches to the other side to express discontent, to express um, potential resolutions to conflicts, or perhaps to make proposals about um, the way they want to change their alliance or the fur trade or, or, or something like that. Uh, this speech making occurred around a council fire. And they were usually convened in public. Both Native Americans and Europeans attached public hearing, you know, attached a notion of kind of uh, propriety uh, to having public meetings, so, you know, that, that, that there would be other observers. Meetings that didn't happen in public, uh, what we might call backroom deals, they called it happening in the bushes. Uh, and, you know, and meetings that happened in the bushes had that connotation of kind of people pulling the strings behind the scene, perhaps acting out of selfish interests rather than representing the interests of their people or their government or something like that. So both sides like the idea of convening these treaties in, in, in towns like Lancaster. Some convened in Philadelphia, many convened in Albany, some convened in Boston. Generally speaking, Native Americans preferred that these meetings occur in frontier towns. They were a little easier for the Indians to get to, and the Indians weren't as threatened by uh, communicable diseases. Places like Philadelphia and Boston had large populations. Smallpox was a threat to Indians who traveled to those regions. And so Easton, Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Albany, New York, these were small frontier towns that became center for this kind of diplomacy. This is an image from a map uh, that was produced in 1765 that shows a treaty conference happening on the Ohio frontier after a British military expedition into the region. And it, it's not a perfect image, but it's one that somewhat approximates what happened uh, at Lancaster in 1744. You have an outdoor meeting you know, oftentimes in these towns, there wasn't a public building large enough to accommodate the size of the audience that these meetings would attract. You have a group of officials, in this case, British military officers, sitting around the council fire on one side, and you have a group of Indian males sitting on the other side, 
Uh, this Indian is making a speech at the council fire. He has a wampum belt that he's holding in his hand as he makes his speech. But if you look around the scene, you also see the tents of the soldiers who are in camp nearby. Here's a, a Scottish soldier. We can tell he's a Scottish soldier. He's wearing a kilt uh, right there, all right? Uh, if this was Lancaster, they wouldn't be soldiers. They'd be the Indians who had encamped you know, at, at the edge of town and some townspeople. And uh, what I love about this image, too, is you see women in this image. You have uh, an Indian woman here with a child. You have another Indian woman here with a child. And, so, and another one right here. And so they're all kind of part of the scene. Uh, and they're listening to what's going on. And the proceedings kind of have legitimacy because they're occurring out there in the open. You also have, it's worth noting, a colonial secretary right there who's basically serving the purposes of a stenographer, taking down notes, you know, who's, who's recording what's going on. Um, which raises a very interesting question, which is if these were people of European and Native American descent, and they didn't speak each other's languages, right? How did they actually communicate with each other? Um, and there are two primary ways through which that happened. And I want to spend some time now talking about that. The first is interpreters. It was very important to have interpreters who could uh, relate the substance of a speech given by one side to the other side. And over the history of these meetings, um, we, uh, we see several different types of people emerge as being uh, kind of the, the typical interpreters. Uh, missionaries. Missionaries we've already talked about in class. We know missionaries made an effort to learn Native American languages. And so missionaries often served as interpreters at these treaty conferences. And they're converts. Native American Christians uh, who had learned perhaps French, perhaps Dutch, perhaps English, well enough to serve as interpreters uh, would uh, sometimes serve this role as well. Um, you might also have fur traders serving as interpreters and Native American women that fur traders uh, had married who picked up language, you know, the fur traders picking up language by virtue of their uh, engagement with Native American communities, a Native American woman who learned some European language from uh, her fur trader husband, or their children, uh, people, uh, children of biracial heritage, the, the, the product of these unions between fur traders and their women. Uh, you know, growing up with a foot in each culture uh, would be capable of doing this. Um, other people who might serve as interpreters, uh, captives. Uh, uh, Native Americans or Europeans who had spent time, sometimes unwillingly, among uh, the other side as, as children. Children absorb, uh, absorb language very quickly. They learn language very quickly. And so uh, sometimes the interpreters were people who had spent time, like I said, willingly or unwillingly, uh, among the uh, other uh, folks on the other side. Uh, on, the, on, on the European side, you know, Indian children who had been placed in schools uh, in an effort to educate them uh, in the English language or to catechize them in Christianity. On the Indian side, it would be um, uh, oftentimes young uh, people who had been taken captive during wars and brought up in Indian families who would serve this role. Uh, at the Treaty of Lancaster, the most important interpreter was a fellow named Conrad Weiser. And have any of you ever heard of Conrad Weiser before? He's one of these early Americans who has a fascinating story to him. If you drive east of Gettysburg uh, and you go into Amish country, uh, you'll find the Conrad Weiser Homestead. It's a state historic site that you can visit today. He was uh, born in Germany and came over in the 1710s to New York with a large group of German migrants who were very poor. And when they got to New York, moved up into the Mohawk region, Mohawk Valley region, in order to find land. And basically live as kind of this pretty insular German-speaking community. They wanted to be far away. They didn't want to be bothered by, by folks. But as a young boy, uh, Conrad Weiser was uh, taken by his father and placed in a local Mohawk community. The, the German immigrants wanted somebody to develop the language skills to communicate with the Indians who lived nearby. And so as a boy, Conrad Weiser went to live with the Mohawks and he learned the Mohawk language. And then as an adult, he moved into Pennsylvania. He came down the Susquehanna Valley 
and became a fur trader and a farmer on the Pennsylvania frontier. And because of his language skills, became an interpreter for the colony of Pennsylvania, also uh, served as an interpreter for the colony of Virginia uh, at, the, um, at the Treaty of Lancaster in 1744. He had a pretty good reputation. The Native Americans liked him and spoke of him as, as having two sides, an Indian side and, uh, and a European side. Um, colonial governments generally trusted him, uh, considered him to be fairly upright. Unlike a lot of interpreters who they didn't trust because they might have been of a different ethnicity or they you know, never trusted fur traders and that sort of thing. But Weiser had a good reputation not only for his ability to speak native languages, but also to understand and interpret and teach the protocol of diplomatic exchange. Cadwalder Colden was a, um, a, a New York official, he's Scottish, that's a great Scottish name, uh, who, who migrated to New York about the same time as Conrad Weiser. And Colden, uh, in the 1720s, wrote a history of the Iroquois. He was very much interested in, in the Iroquois League. Historians still read his history of them today. It's not really a great book. Uh, but, uh, but it's still read today because he's probably the first history of the Iroquois written in the English language. But this is what he had to say about, um, about Native American oratory. Like many of his peers, he was fascinated by Native American speech, but he didn't speak the language himself. And so when he attended treaty conferences, he had to rely on interpreters. And he said, I suspect our interpreters may not have done justice to the Indians' eloquence. For the Indians may strongly move our passions by their lively images. I have heard an old Indian sachem speak with much vivacity and elocution, so that the speaker pleased and moved the auditors with the manner of delivering his discourse. In other words, he's witnessed Indian speakers who were able to move their audiences even though their audiences didn't understand a word they were saying. All right? uh, and this is an image, again, from a, it's not from Colden's book. It's from a, a French book from, from that era. But presenting Indian speaker, you know, an Indian speaker and his audience, and you know, what's this look like? It's like a scene out of ancient Rome, right? Uh, wearing togas and, and, and around a public forum somewhere. And so this, this notion that Europeans had that Indians had this innate gift to communicate uh, through speech without necessarily relying on words to do so. You know, so what does that mean? Well, gesture, the cadence of their voice, their posture, the way they, they, they moved about the room, all of these things uh, were evidence of the Indians' eloquence. Uh, check out this image. This image was actually based on the image we saw earlier from that map in the Ohio country, right? Um, this image was done by the American artist Benjamin West, who I've already mentioned to you, who was living in London in the 1760s when an account of that treaty conference in Ohio was being published. And he, he did this image for it. And I, I want to point out a few things to you about, oops, sorry about that, about, uh, about this. So here's our Indian speaker, right? See his gesture, right? He's pointing with his, with, with his finger. He's at the council fire. He's got a wampum belt in his hand. We have all these other uh, Indian fellows sitting around him. This guy's smoking his pipe, pipe tomahawk, as he's, uh, as he's engaged in this. And then look at his, his audience. This is Colonel Henry Bouquet, the commander of the uh, English army that marched out to the Ohio country, all right? This is the secretary who's writing things down. And these are officers who are listening. And look at the rapt attention, right? Every, every one of these listeners, even among the, the Native American listeners, are just they're enraptured by this fellow speaking. The one thing that we don't see in this image, there's no interpreter. All right? uh, so what's the artist trying to tell you? He's telling you that this Native American, simply by the sheer force of his presence and his eloquence, is moving these people, uh, you know, this guy with his hand over his heart, you know, this guy concentrating, leaning on the shoulder of the fellow in front of him, this guy writing it all down. What's he writing down, right? Uh, there's, there's no interpreter there. But, uh, but clearly they're being moved. Uh, people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, the Enlightenment thinkers of the 18th century, believed that Native American societies were literally younger than European societies. The Western Hemisphere was created later than the Eastern Hemisphere. Therefore, Native Americans were closer to kind of the origin of creation in time than Europeans. 
you know, what does the creation story tell us? It, it tells us that up until the Tower of Babel, everyone spoke the same language, and then God, in order to punish the hubris of humanity, divided it up into different languages. So according to that version of creation, all human languages descended from a common root. Well, if Native Americans were younger than Europeans, their languages were literally closer to that common root than European languages. And people like Franklin and Jefferson believe that you should study Native American languages for this purpose. It will help you understand the origins of human languages around the globe. They also believed that that very first language, that natural language, was still kind of hardwired into us. And so if you heard it being spoken, even though you couldn't comprehend mentally the words, it would still move you. And that's what this image is telling you, this fascination with Native American oratory that even though you can't understand the words, the gesture, the cadence, the movement of the speaker, there's this kind of emotional wallop that it's packing that is being communicated. So that's speeches as um, a source of fascination and interest among these folks. Uh, I can pause for a minute and answer any questions if anybody has a question. All right, we're ready to move on. All right, I want to talk about another type of exchange that went on at these treaty conferences, and that's uh, the exchange of, of objects. All right, um, ways in which Europeans and Indians communicated without necessarily making speeches or sharing words. Uh, rituals of exchange. We've already mentioned um, wampum belts, and I just wanted to um, go back to wampum belts a little bit and talk about them in terms of their design. You did a reading for today based on a treaty conference that William Johnson was having uh, in Niagara and then Detroit. And if you paid attention, you saw that whenever Johnson or one of his um, uh, Indian contemporaries was making a speech, the, the points of the speech were punctuated by the exchange of either wampum strings or wampum belts. And so these became devices, not just for offering condolences and initiating treaty uh, proceedings, but also devices to make your meaning clear to an audience that perhaps did not speak the same language as you did. Generally speaking, the larger the wampum belt, the more important the point that you were making. And that's why when you read the Johnson document, you'll see references to a large belt, you know, or uh, a belt of this many strings versus a belt of that many strings. All right? Those physical descriptions became very important because the wampum carried its own message. And so here you see some of these um, wampum belts and their designs. This one, using the, the contrast between the purple and the white to emphasize two paths or two roads. Uh, Native Americans often interpreted these sorts of designs as a, as a kind of, you go your way, I'll go mine, right? Uh, we'll trade and communicate with each other, but each side has its own path to follow. Uh, this is a wampum belt that has human figures that are linking arms, that are holding hands. They kind of look like paper cutout dolls. And again, that image of linkage, whether it's human figures or a chain or geometric designs like diamonds or rectangles, is meant to emphasize a certain parity, a certain uh, volitional alliance. It's not a design that emphasizes hierarchy. I'm better than you are. You know, you're subordinate to me. It's a design that says we are all equal partners in this particular alliance. So wampum worked that way. Um, another great image of a wampum belt. Uh, so this is a black wampum belt. Remember, uh, purple or black symbolizes war, and the white has been used to form the image of a hatchet. And so one of the other very common idioms of American English that arises out of this diplomacy is taking up the hatchet or burying the hatchet, right? Whenever you're going to make amends with somebody that you've had a fight with, well, we're going to bury the hatchet. Well, that's where this phrase comes from, because oftentimes the symbolism of the hatchet was meant to symbolize either I want you to uh, take up the hatchet and go to war with me against a common enemy, or it's time to make peace, let us bury the hatchet and renew trade and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the uh, uh, wampum belts could be accepted. They could be, uh, you know, say, uh, 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 the other side might say, no thanks. You know, we're going to think about that before we accept that belt. In some cases, they were rejected, like, literally kicked away or thrown into the dust. You know, that was a way of expressing extreme anger, was to uh, not only refuse the wampum belt, but to abuse it in some physical way. Right. Uh, other types of 
of exchange that went on here. Uh, food, drink, and tobacco. These were items that were very important to how these uh, treaty negotiations began and how they ended. When Indians traveled to a colonial town like Lancaster or Easton, Pennsylvania, uh, for a treaty conference, they expected to be treated well by their colonial hosts. And so that would involve oftentimes toasts uh, at when, when they arrived. It would involve a feast at some point during the course of the proceedings. And it would involve provisions for their families while they were encamped on the edge of town and, and all this stuff was going down. That's why this stuff was so expensive for colonial governments. And you know, colonial governors are always like, on the clock, let's get this thing moving, right? Uh, and the Indians are always like, well, you know, we kind of like it here, and uh, aren't we going to have a feast tonight? You know, and, uh, and, uh, and that was the Indians' way of kind of drawing out the proceedings, making it more expensive for the colonial governor, making him more pliable and more willing to kind of hear their complaints and perhaps bend to their will. Um, you know, there's, there's oftentimes this image that we have of um, these uh, treaties being kind of bacchanalias where, you know, rum was flowing freely and colonists were using liquor to um, uh, cheat Indians in land and trade and so forth. And, and alcohol was certainly part of the gifting that went on at these. But for the most part, um, you know, with the emphasis on things being open and in the public, there was not this, there was not abuse. You know, it was, it was more commonly used as in the context of hospitality rituals, of offering a toast at the beginning, offering a toast at the end. At the end of the um, Lancaster Treaty in 1744, the governor of Pennsylvania is uh, wrapping things up, and, he, and he's, he calls for a toast to the Indians. And he says the first toast, uh, he, he has them pour out, uh, he has these small kind of cordial glasses brought out, and he has rum poured out in a very small amount. And they toast, and that's it. And then the next day they come back, and the Indians kind of make their closing speech, and the governor calls for a toast again. Only this time he has them bring out big wine glasses. And he has the wine glasses filled up with rum. And he says, those glasses you had yesterday were our French glasses. Now we're giving you a toast in our English glasses. The idea being the French are cheap, and the French don't supply you with the goods and the hospitality that we do. And now this toast symbolizes our much superior regard for you. So that's an example of how alcohol uh, might be used in this context. Another way in which um, uh, kind of connections were made across the council fire, the exchange of names. Uh, Native Americans would give names to uh, colonial governors that would admit them into these alliances. And then those names would pass from one colonial governor to the next. So the, the governor of New York was Corlear. He was that Dutch fur trader I introduced you to last week uh, who drowned in Lake Champlain. But after that, every subsequent New York governor was named Corlear. And in, in Pennsylvania, the governor was named Onus. That was the name that they had given to William Penn. And it was actually a, a pun. William Penn's name, P-E-N-N, -N, meant pen like pen in your hand. Onus meant, uh, uh, meant feather, quill. And so when they called Penn Onus, they were saying his name in our language is, is, is Onus, is Penn. And, um, and so every subsequent uh, uh, colonial governor of Pennsylvania was known as Onus in these negotiations. In Maryland, uh, at, at the Maryland delegation at the Treaty of Lancaster in 1744 um, is given the name Tokeri Hogan. Uh, Tokeri, Tokeri Hogan, they are told, means the honored place in between. They are between the government of Pennsylvania and between the government of Virginia. All right? uh, of course, when these names happened, there was an expectation that there would be presents offered in response. You know? And so the colonial delegation of Maryland hosts a feast for, uh, for the Indians in exchange for, for, for this name. So it's all about this sort of reciprocity that has to be learned. Conrad Weiser is there to make this clear, to kind of tap the Maryland guys on the shoulder and say, hey, they just gave you a name. You better, you better pony up here, right? Uh, Conrad Weiser actually, um, at one point at the Treaty of Lancaster, sits down with the colonial delegates who are about to have a dinner in the courthouse with the Indians and says, we got to go over some etiquette issues here, guys, uh, and, and tells them the proper way to interact with these Native American dinner guests that they're going to be having. So that kind of emphasis on not just you know, talking to the Indians, but also learning to engage with them in this social way is very, very important.
Uh, let's wrap up here by talking a little bit about the outcome of these treaties, uh, what, the, what, what kind of artifacts they, they, they produced. So the colonial secretary would be jotting down notes. If a, an agreement was reached, especially when it came to land, a, a land session, Native Americans would have their names written out by the secretary, and then they would write uh, these sort of pictographs next to their names representing, uh, usually these are clan totems, right? Uh, a, a chief of a particular clan within that particular nation. So that was a big objective of um, the colonial governors when they convened these meetings was to get Indians to sign a document, right? That signature on the document means they, they agreed to this land session, they agreed to this, uh, these, these points we addressed. And then in some cases, not all, but in some cases, those treaties were published. Uh, colonial printers like Benjamin Franklin uh, uh, published these. Franklin published this one uh, in 1745. So the year after the treaty at Lancaster. These were not bestsellers of their day. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you people gathered around Franklin's print shop, you know, waiting for the next Indian treaty to come out. But they did circulate. And oftentimes, uh, editors gave glosses to what was going on to try to explain the rituals uh, uh, that, that, that were described here. And so they did become kind of a guide for people who were interested in understanding the rules, the protocol of Native American diplomacy. In the case of the Treaty of Lancaster, which did circulate in, in London, uh, the, the chief Iroquois speaker was a guy named Canis Atigo. And he gave some very famous speeches at the Treaty of Lancaster. So famous that in 1755, when a London novelist was writing a romance novel, he made Canis Satigo a character in it. Uh, he had him coming over to London and you know, falling in love with an English girl and, and, and that sort of thing. Canis Satigo had been dead for five years uh, when he did that. Uh, but, uh, but, the, you know, but the figure of Canis Satigo had become you know, uh, uh, familiar enough uh, to readers in London that he could, he could serve this purpose in a romance novel. For the Native Americans themselves, of course, there is this distrust of what Canis Satigo at Lancaster called pen and ink work, you know, pointing to the colonial secretary saying, you know, we know that the guy writing that stuff down isn't necessarily serving our interests. Uh, and, it, and, and they knew, especially when it came to land purchases and whatnot, that um, oftentimes what was written down did not reflect what they thought had actually occurred at the treaty conference. And so wampum belts were archived. Wampum belts became the equivalent of the printed treaty or the, you know, the manuscript treaty for the Native Americans. Wampum belts were kept. They could be brought back out at subsequent treaties as evidence of what had happened. They would be used by Native American speakers to remind Europeans of commitments they had made at previous treaties. You know, this belt signifies what you'd agreed to at Lancaster in 1744 and Easton in 1763. And, uh, you know, into the 19th century, they were kept as a way of kind of preserving for the Native Americans the history of these diplomatic relationships uh, that had their origins in the colonial period. Um, today, the unique uh, nature of Native Americans in the United States, the fact that they have this kind of semi-sovereign status that uh, separates them from the states in which uh, they live, is a legacy of this treaty making that occurred in the colonial era and in the revolutionary era. Uh, it was recognition that Indians operated as separate sovereign nations who met in these diplomatic situations to you know, negotiate and conduct their own affairs in their best interests. And when Native Americans today claim a special relationship with the federal government that's distinct from relationships with state governments, they're basing those claims on treaties that were signed uh, in the 19th, 18th centuries. I mean, some even predate that, but for our purposes in the federal government, the federal government's uh, Supreme Court's interested in treaties signed after 1776, right? Uh, but, um, but you get the idea. Treaty making is at the core of native claims to sovereignty to this day in the United States. Any questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, we're going to end there. Uh, thank you all for coming. We will see you on Monday, and we'll start talking about captivity.